Are Roman Catholics Christian? Is there such a difference between the Roman Catholic Church and Evangelicalism that they're actually two different groups? Or are we all the same? Today we're going to find out. Welcome back to Marking Up the Word. Today we are in Romans chapter 3. Let's just hop right into it. Starting at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, this passage is perhaps the most important passage in all of Scripture. Now, I know that people love to say that whenever they come to a different passage and they're like, oh, this is the most important one. Or, uh, you know, a pastor might say, this is the most important sermon I've ever preached. And sometimes you can hear that and you can kind of roll your eyes a little bit and be like, okay, that's what you said last time. Well, I'm not just saying that because, you know, it's just my opinion. I'm going to stand on the shoulders of someone a lot smarter than me. Uh, Martin Luther called this the chief point of Scripture. He went as far as to say that this was the central place of this epistle. And of the whole Bible. Now, I want you to think about that. This is someone who has been so impactful in Christianity, calling this section of Scripture the central place, the, the, the central chief idea in all of scripture is found here in this passage now why would he say that well because in this passage we have the difference between catholicism and true christianity and yes i'm going to separate those two and i'm going to explain it in a little bit here why i am making that distinction because they are not the same regardless of what teacher you might have heard uh, regardless of what pastor or priest that you have listened to and had discussions with, uh, according to what the Roman Catholic Church has publicly stated, and we'll look into it a little bit, uh, and what Martin Luther and the rest of the Reformers declared, uh, and what Scripture, I think, very clearly testifies to, is that these two groups are very distinct. And for Martin Luther... This was the point between salvation and damnation. And that's why he says this, this phrase here, the central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible, because in this passage, we see that distinction. And in this passage, we have the gospel declared more boldly and more clearly than perhaps anywhere else in Scripture. Now, let's get into it. Uh, but now, so we need to remember here with the arguments that have been made in the last couple sections that we've been talking a lot about the past. Uh, we've been talking about the idea of revealed scripture and uh, the law that God has uh, imprinted on the heart of every human being and how that we're equal, uh, regardless of what revelation you've been given, the the real thing that we have in our lives that we that we have that is true to this judge is that we've sinned against that revealed scripture or uh, against the law that he has imprinted on our hearts and so we're equal standing and we're equally damned in the eyes of a holy and righteous god and so then the question becomes you know how are, how are we going to get out of this situation um i don't want to be damned uh, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to have to face a holy and righteous God and, and feel his wrath. That sounds unpleasant. I don't want that. I don't think you want that. So how do we get out of it? And that question is where we're going to see the distinction between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, or I would say true Christianity. So that was in the past. What do you do about revealed scripture? 
and, and uh, following the law and all of that and uh, those outside the law. And now Paul is bringing it into the moment and saying, all right, based on that background, and this is a clear distinction. Like I said uh, in the last passage, uh, in the last study that we had, uh, this is like the conclusion that that 19 and 20 is pretty much like the conclusion, like that last uh, paragraph in a book chapter. And, and now we're moving on. And that's that's basically what he's doing. He's been talking about the past. And now he's talking about, all right, well, let's let's talk about today. Let's talk about you as a as a person today. How can you be justified? Uh, how can you be declared righteous? And that's the key. And that's what he says here. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Now, this is the thing that we want, because we've already seen that we're guilty. Jews, Gentiles, we've all sinned against the Holy God. We're all equally guilty. Uh, we are all equally awaiting his wrath for what we've done. So then, you know, then it becomes a thing of, yeah, how do we get that righteousness? That is that standard that God demands. Uh, how, can, how can we get that? But now the righteousness of God, the thing that we want, I'll just put it here, what we need has been manifested, and here's the interesting phrase here, apart from the law. So what Paul is saying is that inside that law, that the, that the Jews and those who would have had um, access to the Old Testament, to Scripture, uh, that God has actually worked in a way outside of that to bring about this uh, righteousness that we need. So again, like we said last week, the law was never intended. It was never its purpose to bring someone to salvation. It was never its purpose to deliver anyone. All it was meant to do was to condemn us, to show us our sin, to show us how wicked and vile, and as we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, totally depraved we really are. And so now this righteousness of God has been manifested or it has appeared and it's appeared and come about outside of the law. So it's not through the law that we can find this righteousness or attain this righteousness or earn this righteousness. And that's important because that's going to be a clear distinction as we move forward and talk about these two different uh, groups, the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants. Uh, that's the defining hallmark of really what it means to be one of the other is how do you view the law? How do you view obedience to the law in regards to deliverance or salvation? So now the righteousness of God, the thing that we need to be declared justified has come about and it's not through the law, apart from the law. But just in case everyone is getting a little worried and but maybe even people who are reading this letter from Paul would be worried, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So it's not that salvation is completely devoid from the law, like it's a separate thing. Uh, it's that the, the law cannot give you what you need in that salvation. Rather, it was only foretold in the law and the prophets that this righteousness of God would come at a later time. So, uh, I think something that we can get very clearly from this passage is that the gospel is not plan B. Because a lot of people actually view it that way. That, okay, well, you had the law and you had the Old Testament and it just didn't pan out for people. They, they, it was too much. It was too much of a burden. And those people just couldn't fulfill all the requirements of those 613 rules. And so God made another way. Uh, and, and maybe they would even put it that way. Another. Uh, basically saying that there's an equivalence between there's two different ways. There's another way. And no one can get through the first way. And so God had to provide a second way. That is not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying that 
the law was never meant to be that way. It was only to point us in the direction of that way. It was a sign. It was a sign on the road telling us this way, basically saying, you are a sinner and you need something and it's coming. So have faith. Now, some people did have faith. Many did not and thought that, okay, well, if I do these things, then, then I'll be declared righteous in the end. I will be, you know, a true Jew. And what this passage is saying is like, no, that's not true. It was never meant to be the way. It was never meant to be the, the pathway for deliverance. You could never earn it, not even in the Old Testament, not through all the sacrifices, not through all the ceremonial cleansing rituals that God put in place. That was only to point you toward the way. And here, it, it clearly is being told to us that this was the plan the whole time. It was, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like God was, you know, thrown for a loop and it was like, oh man, I thought these guys could, could figure this out. I thought these guys could, you know, uh, do some good things and be able to achieve what I want from them or for them. And, and so I guess, I guess I'm just going to have to make another path here and make it a little easier on them. That, that's not what God did. God is not a reactionary God. This was the plan the whole time. And so he sets it in motion from the very beginning. And the law and the prophets bear witness to this fact that the righteousness of God was going to now be manifested. That it was now going to come. And it was going to come through a specific way. Now, as we kind of dive through this a little bit and we talk about these distinctions between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants. The main distinctions at that time in 1517 when a guy who looked somewhat like this <laughs> uh, went to the church door there in Wittenberg and nailed those 95 theses and, and lit the fire of the Reformation. There were essentially five points, five points that uh, maybe set them apart from the Roman Catholic Church. That was like the main defining differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. So what were those and uh, are they biblical? Well, the first is sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. These are Latin phrases. So scripture alone. Um, another one that we can look at is sola fide, which means faith alone. There's, of course, let's do a little, uh, a little bit different of a color. Solus Christus, which is Christ alone. And for right now, we're only going to look at four of them. Um, but I will, you know, not hold you in suspense. Sola gratia which is grace alone. And let's end here on sola deo gloria, which is to the glory of God alone. So these were the phrases that the, the Protestants used to define really their differences. You know, 95 theses, well, you know, in the grand scope of things, 95 points isn't all that much to say this is what is the difference between your religion and true religion or your version of Christianity and true Christianity. That's actually pretty, pretty clear to look at just 95, but to boil it down even further, it's really these two, uh, these five points. So let's look at four of them that are very clearly in this passage. And as we go through this passage, we can understand why Martin Luther called this the central place of this epistle and of the whole Bible, because this is where the, the soul has come from. This passage, uh, you know, you can find it in other places in Scripture. You'll find it all over Scripture, uh, specifically all over the New Testament. You're going to see the solas. But here is where we see all the solas together in such a clear way. So today we're only going to see four in this beginning section of this passage. But as we go through, we're going to see just how biblical the Protestants were in understanding that these were 
true biblical facts. These solas were not some abstract idea that these, you know, very intellectual men came up with and said, well, I think it's this and let's uh, break from the Catholic Church because we believe these things that we've kind of just come up with on our own. These are very clearly scriptural ideas. So although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, what would that be? Well, I think pretty clearly we can see that, yes, this is talking about sola scriptura because we're talking about how scripture points to this fact not tradition not some abstract idea that some men came up with that would point us in the direction of understanding that this righteousness of god has come into play and and it's through a specific person rather than through works well we see that in scripture sola scriptura the law and the prophets bear witness to it and the righteousness of God, just to be even more clear, you know, he's kind of helping, again, the, the people who would consider uh, themselves Jews who had revealed scripture. He's kind of helping them to understand the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then he gets into really like the, the meat of this thing. So this is this is where this is where we see really that central place of this epistle and the whole Bible really come into play. So the righteousness of God, again, that is the thing that we need. We want that. We want that so that we could be justified. The righteousness of God comes about how? Not through works, not through obedience of the law. Here he says, through faith. And here he says, for all who believe connecting these two ideas. What is that? Well, you can see just by the color. Ooh, horrible arrow there. Um, but sola fide. It's faith alone. The, the righteousness of God is manifested through faith. How can you get that thing that you desperately need so that you don't, you know, go to hell? and are condemned and damned before the righteous judge, how can you get out of that? Well, it's through sincere faith and belief, not through doing anything. And here, he's not going to add on to this. You know, this is this is Paul giving the, the main points of the gospel and saying this is what it means to believe the gospel. And in no place does he add anything on to it. He just says it, as simply as belief. Now, he gives even the person. Let's look here. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there's some debate about exactly what that means because of the preposition there. But I, th I think it's very clearly, and we're going to see just even as we get into the next study, it's, it's abundantly clear that he is the object of this faith. Uh, that you believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was perfect, that he, he was the substitute, as we'll see very clearly as we talk about what it means to have propitiation for our sins, that he is the substitute for our sins on the cross. So belief in him alone is what is necessary for salvation to get that righteousness of God that we desperately need to be justified in the sight of this holy God. So through faith in Jesus Christ. So, solus Christus, very clearly. And again, for all who believe. So let, let's, let's camp on that for a minute. Uh, what we're talking about here is not uh, a belief that, you know, then has to have actions that come after. Now, some people you know, get a little confused because they, they might see uh, some distinctions. And I think I'll probably do a, a study on that maybe maybe in a few weeks. We'll, we'll see what happens. Maybe it won't. But uh, the distinctions between uh, how James views the gospel and how Paul in Romans view the gospel and the, the idea of how do works come into play um, for Christians and salvation. Um, so there is, there is some confusion on that. But when Paul gives this, and, and I will say uh, just a, another quote here, Mark, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones calls this 
the test of the gospel. He says that every time that we talk about the gospel, we have to go to this passage, this specific passage, and ask ourselves, is the gospel that I'm preaching, that I'm declaring, is it in line with this passage? Because this passage is the clearest definition of what it means to believe the gospel. And I, I really believe that. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a great preacher. And I, I really do believe. I got that book right there. He says it in there. <laughs> but uh, what, what that means is that every time, every single time that we think about the gospel, uh, we go to a very clear passage. And this is, this is something that we do just in studying the Bible in general, is that when we come to something that we think is hard, like maybe how James views the idea of works, I don't think it's that complicated. It's, it's more than I want to deal with today. But uh, I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. But I will say that there, there might be some confusion there. Well, what do you do with that confusion? You go to the test. You go to the like the very clear definition of the gospel and say, what does this say? And then you take the very clear and go to something that might be a little bit confusing and, and apply it there. You, you, that you interpret scripture from the clear to the unclear or from uh, maybe the, the confusing aspects of scripture. So that's just a, a little side note for you. But uh, this idea of having belief, there is there is no mention, there's no hint of works in this passage. You know, he's already gone through and saying that, you know, no one could fulfill the law. So like works are kind of thrown out the window. And what is necessary here, according to this passage, very clearly from Paul, who is fully inspired from the Holy Spirit, this is directly from God. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So what do you need to be saved? Well, faith in Jesus Christ. Believe in him. And just so we're all on the same page here, I'll, I'll put it down here. Belief is faith in motion. Just in case some people, some people make weird distinctions. Uh... I don't need to put a quote there because that's just me. All right. Uh, some people make weird distinctions on words and try to, you know, make a little bit, well, this is a different word. And so it means, you know, something slightly different. We don't see that anywhere when, uh, especially in scripture, even outside of scripture, that there's really any big difference between faith and belief. The only thing that we really see is that belief is used more as a verb. You know, rather than uh, place your faith or have faith in, uh, most times it, it's just said believe. Uh, so I, I would say that belief is faith in motion. So that's that's what we need in order to be saved is belief in Jesus Christ. No, no works or anything. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like what Jesus says, right? It looks like what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Everyone looks at verse 16. I always tell people, you got to look at verse 15. Because what does that say about salvation? It says that just like the serpent was lifted up in the desert, you know, the bronze serpent, that everyone who looked at that serpent would be healed of their infirmity, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, speaking, obviously, about the cross and him being lifted up on that cross. Uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that all may believe. So just like the serpent, that's the picture being raised up in the desert. Anyone who would look at that serpent would be healed. So must anyone just believe, look to Jesus Christ and they will be saved. It's as simple as that. It's not a, a matter of works. If it was, if it was, then we would look at people like uh, the thief on the cross who repents there and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say to him? He doesn't say, well, first try to clean up your act a little bit. And, uh, you know, what little time you have here, maybe a couple hours here hanging on the cross, you know, uh, make make things right with the people that you stole from. And uh, yeah, we'll think about it. No, he says today you will be with me in paradise. No works mentioned there, no baptism no church membership. Now, why, why am I really hounding on this thing? 
Well, it's because of what the Roman Catholic Church believes. The Roman Catholic Church believes that you have to do works. And, and maybe some priests uh, today would try to word it a little bit differently. But the thing about Catholicism is that any time that the church speaks with authority, ex cathedra, uh, the church, the pope, when they speak in that way, they are saying that they speak for God. And what you, when you speak for God, you can't go back. You can't be like, oh, actually, uh, we, we thought about that and God changed his mind. No. So we look at those documents uh, that the, the Roman Catholic Church has put out. And according to the Roman Catholic Church, they have to agree with those statements. Now, they might try to wiggle out of it by trying to give different definitions. But let's just look at something. Let's just look at one statement uh, from the Council of Trent. Now, the Council of Trent was really the big uh, refutation against uh, the Reformation. That they, this was the, like the one document that they put out and thought, <laughs> you know, they probably sat back and were like, man, we really put the flames out on that one. They're like, look at this document. Well, they didn't. But this is what they wrote. If anyone says that the good works of the justified man are gifts of God in such a way that they are not also the good merits of the justified himself, or that the justified person by the good works he performs through the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit an increase in grace. Look at this. Eternal life, the attainment of eternal life itself, if he dies in grace, so if he dies in grace, and even an increase in glory, let him be anathema. Now, just in case you don't use that phrase, anathema, uh, that means be cursed, be damned, go to hell, is what the Catholic Church says. And because of their dogma, they have to look back at this statement and hold to it. So the Roman Catholic Church as a whole hold to this statement, which clearly says that if anyone thinks that they can be saved apart from good works, they're going to go to hell and they should go to hell. That's what the Roman Catholic Church believes. So that's the defining distinction between these two different groups. And they are different. To say that you have to do good works is to say that the law can save. It's never the point. That was never the point of the law, as we've clearly seen throughout these studies. So through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, the end. That's what it means to be saved, is belief in Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And then he just gives a little summary again, back here uh, at the end of verse 22. For there is no distinction. So just once again. Those who had revelation and those who did not, it is the same standard for salvation today. This is what it means to get the righteousness of God. Believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a Christian culture. It doesn't matter if you grew up in an atheist environment. Um, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have doesn't matter how much obedience to some aspect of the law, some form of moralism that you have. And boy, is moralism just rampant today. It doesn't matter. Those things don't matter. There is no distinction. Uh, this is freely offered. If anyone believes for all, look at that. We kind of skipped over it because we're looking at all these aspects of the Roman Catholic Church. But just in the same way that you know, verse 23 is going to say, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, for all who believe. So the, we're dealing with a bunch of absolutes here. All of us have sinned. We've seen that so clearly over the first three chapters here in Romans. So I'm not going to go too much into verse 23, because I think it's really just a summary of all the arguments that he's made so far. Now it's the transition to giving, giving us that good news. But the reason why... Um, the gospel is so freely available is because sin is for it's everybody it's in all of us and so there has to be provision for that that righteousness of god that we all need in, in a universal way that is freely 
offered to anyone who believes. Now, I will say that we're going to get into the mechanics of that uh, in, in a few chapters here. So uh, for anyone who has issues with the way I word certain things, just know that I word them in such a way because I know where we're going to get to. Um, but that's, that's for later. For right now, it's for all who believe, for there is no distinction in here, for all have sinned. We know that. We get it. We get it, Paul. We've all sinned. We're all totally depraved. But here's the key. Let's, let's give a little bit of difference here. And we've fallen short of the glory of God. What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? Well, it's that standard, that standard of righteousness. And that might not be a great appealing thing to you, but what that shows is the character of God. And when he desires perfection and demands it, if we don't meet that, we are failing the glory of God. We are failing to meet that standard of God's character. And so all of us have done that. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And so we need, once again, we need that righteousness of God. And how does that come? only through faith alone in Jesus Christ. So that's our study for today. I hope that it was helpful. We are going to move now uh, from this idea of the bad news and transition to the good news. And as we do that, we're going to do, you know, we're going to do a couple studies out of just the, the next couple verses here, break it up over a few studies because we have some really big ideas and we're going to take them one at a time to really make sure that we have the right definitions as we move forward in the passage. Because as Luther said, the central place of this epistle and of the whole Bible. Uh, so we, we need to make sure that we understand the, the main aspects of the central point before we move forward in this book. So uh, we'll be back on Saturday for another study. If you want to get a hold of me, chat with me on YouTube here, you can leave a comment. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you liked the video as well. And uh, hit me up on Twitter at Dean Lentini, on Instagram at Grumpy Baptist. If you're listening to the podcast, I'd appreciate it if you uh, rate and review and subscribe. And I will see you on Saturday.